So we've been talking about conflicts, conflict serializability, determining if a schedule is serializable and why do we care if it's serializable? Because serializable schedules look like serial schedules. Why do we care about serial schedules? Because serial schedules demonstrate isolation. So basically, we're basically going through this entire process to try to see if we interweave the actions in this order, does it look like, is the final result like as if we had just done one transaction and then another? And why aren't we just doing one transaction and then another? Because often by interweaving these different actions, we can make things go faster. Maybe it's um, your computer can able to read from 10 different places at once. And so instead of just doing read from this person, then read from this person, then read from this person, just do all 10 at once and be able to satisfy a lot more queries than you started with. However, that is a pain. There is a lot of schedulers work by building schedules, checking for conflict serializability, doing modifications until they get to a conflict serializable schedule. That is a really hard challenge. Instead, I'm gonna show you a much easier way, a way that you're actually going to be doing in some of your later projects involving using locks. Now, if you've taken any classes on concurrency, if you've taken any classes on parallel programming, you'll be familiar with the stuff that we're gonna be doing here, though the stuff we're gonna be doing here is on a much easier level than that for locks. So the way locks are for this class is it they're used to help the scheduler make sure that they don't ever get into an inconsistent database state, to make sure that the actions you perform are never able to conflict with each other. And so a scheduler uses locks to make this happen. A locking scheduler, which is a scheduler that uses locks, strangely enough, enforces conflict serializability. And what is conflict serializability? It means you can perform those um, non-conflicting swaps to get to a serializable schedule. And this is actually a much more stringent rule than strictly necessary. If a smarter... <coughs> <coughs> and this is actually a much more stringent rule than is strictly necessary. For instance, if you, a scheduler was smarter and it could determine are there coincidences, if it could determine if um, actually even though these um, uh, actions conflict with each other, if you also switch these things as well, then everything else works out. It's a much more um, conservative way to generate schedules. So smarter schedules can do better than locking schedulers, but locking schedulers are much simpler to understand and to reason about, which is why they're much more common. And so the way this works is given transactions must request and release locks in addition to reading and writing their databases. And we'll talk about the rules in the next slide of when do you need to get a lock and when do you need to release that lock, give it up. So the rules for locks are twofold. One is called consistency of transactions. And now these rules sound complicated, but they're actually quite intuitive. A transaction is only allowed to read or write an element if it was previously granted a lock on that element, it got permission. The lock is what allows it to do the read and write, and it hasn't released the lock before it tried to do the read and write. It's pretty obvious. It basically means in order to read or write, you better be holding the lock, and the only way for you to be holding a lock is that you were granted the lock and didn't give it up yet. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. The other part of this rule is if a transaction locks an element, meaning it gets a lock to write or read from a particular element, it must at some point unlock that element. It's not allowed to hold on to the lock forever. Usually they, it unlocks the lock maybe when it's done with the reader write, or it releases it at the end of the transaction. Both are fine. It just needs to give it up eventually. All right, the other rule is called legality of schedules. And this is also a pretty simple rule. It says no two transactions may lock the same element without the one having first released the lock. Basically, it's no two transactions can have the same lock on the same element, okay? which is the whole point of locks is that only one person, only one transaction can have the lock at any given time. All right, so sometimes these rules are written in a little bit more complicated of fashion. I'm gonna be showing you the notation for how you show locks in our um, ways. So you say, and once again, uh, the L here looks a lot like a one, but this is a L for lock on a transaction I on database element X. So it means transaction I requests a lock on database element X. The way that you write the releasing the lock or another way to say it, it unlocks the lock. I'm gonna write it with a little U so that it doesn't um, look a lot like a read. This is a U says I'm unlocking the lock on database element X and I'm transaction I.
Okay. And so the way we can actually write the previous rules using this notation. So the rules for consistency of transactions is whenever a transaction i has an action, so that's a read of transaction i on x or a write of transaction i on x, there must be a previous action which is locking i, l sub i of x, with no intervening unlocks, u sub i of x, and there must be at some point a subsequent u of i of x. So it's saying you have to have the lock, not have already given it up, and eventually you must give it up. That seems pretty simple. The other thing is the legality of schedules, which basically says if there are actions like transaction i gets a lock on x, followed by transaction j gets a lock on x in the schedule, somewhere between these actions there must be a transaction i unlocks x. So there's no way for a transaction to get a lock if it hasn't been released by somebody else. All right. So now using these two rules, let's check whether or not this schedule is legal. All right, so let's go through it and we can check the rules. So I get a lock on A. Am I able to get a lock on A? Sure, nobody before has a lock on A. And then I do a read from A. Do, does transaction one have a lock on A? Sure it does, it got it right here. Transaction one releases the lock on A. Is that allowed? Yeah, because it got the lock here. Great job, transaction one. Transaction two gets a lock on A. Is it allowed to? Yeah, because even though transaction A got a lock here, it unlocked it. So really, nobody has a lock at this point. Transaction two gets this lock on A. Transaction 2 gets a lock on B. Is it allowed to do that? Sure, nobody has a lock on B. So now transaction 2 has two locks, A and B. It does a read on A, it does a write on B. It's allowed to do both of those things because it has the locks. It does another write on B. It's allowed to do that because it does. It has the lock on B. It unlocks B, great. Transaction 3 gets the lock on B. Is it allowed to? Sure, nobody has the lock on B at this point. It does its write, it unlocks it. And then transaction 2, releases its other lock on A, because transaction two got two locks, it only gave up one of them. So then the question is, is this schedule legal? Yeah, it follows both the rules of consistency of transactions as well as legality of schedule. Right? And once again, I would recommend working through this and making sure you're comfortable with what are the rules. It's basically saying you have to get a lock before you're allowed to read or write, you have to unlock it eventually, and no two people can have a lock at the same time on the same element. Okay, so if we go back to our previous example from a couple videos ago, we had our two transactions, one that adds 100 to the numbers a, to the database elements A and B, and one that doubles the elements A and B. And we determined that this schedule of these reads and writes, and these reads and writes, these reads and writes, leads to an inconsistent state, right? This is a bad schedule. But let's see what happens when we add locks. So I've just done the same thing, but I've added getting a lock on A, releasing a lock on A, getting a lock on A, releasing a lock on A, getting a lock on B, releasing a lock on B, getting a lock on B, releasing a lock on B. Is this schedule, going from top to bottom here, is this schedule consistent with both the, um, uh, the two rules for locking behavior? Yeah, every time there's a read, the, the transaction has the appropriate lock and they, they release the lock at some point and no two uh, uh, transactions have a lock on the same element at any point in time. So wait, you could be, should be going, Josh, what the hell? We went through all of this trouble to learn what locks are. They don't even do us any good. And that's because the two rules that I've told you so far are incomplete. Having consistency of transactions and legality of schedules does not enforce conflict serializability. It doesn't mean that you are guaranteed to have a serializable schedule. And that is where I'm gonna leave you for this week on this horrible cliffhanger. You have to tune in next week to learn how to actually make sure that by using uh, consistency of transactions, legality of schedules, and one more component that you will actually get conflict serializability. You'll actually be able to make sure that those, this, those evil schedules like this aren't actually possible.